funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Brianna Venosi. Big changes starting today across the state as COVID-19 restrictions begin lifting. Just in time to celebrate mom this weekend or head to the prom, outdoor gathering limits are now capped at 500 people. Indoor gatherings can increase up to 50% capacity, but no more than 250 people. If you have a favorite local spot, you can once again grab a seat at the bar. Starting today, you can also hit the buffet buffet line and dance floor at weddings and other private catered events, though still not at clubs or bars. Even more reopenings are on the way in less than two weeks as the state lifts most capacity limits indoors, all steps toward moving into a post-pandemic life. With the number of new positive cases remaining steady at just over 1,300 today, but with 29 more lives lost. This as news comes that Pfizer and its partner BioNTech are asking the FDA for full approval of their coronavirus vaccine for those age 16 and older. Right now, it's being used under an emergency use authorization in the U.S. It could take six to 10 months for that approval to be given, though. In the meantime, the drug maker is asking the FDA to extend their current authorization to include vaccines for kids 12 to 15 years old, a decision that could come as early as next week. Joanna Gagas reports on the efforts to get kids closer to vaccination here at home. We already know a lot about the efficacy of these vaccines. We are going to be mostly looking at whether children are able to produce an immune response to the vaccine and to what level that immune response is and if it is protective. That'll be the goal of a clinical trial studying Pfizer's vaccine in children conducted by the Pediatric Clinical Research Center at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. It'll follow 50 kids aged six months to two years, 50 kids aged two to five years, and up to 100 kids five to 12 years old, all for two years. Internationally, there'll only be about 4,600 kids studied, much less than the adult clinical trials there will be uh, multiple different doses tried. Uh, so that's where it's really important to do it in children because we do have to figure out the dose. And they'll be looking for side effects. Generally, what we know about vaccines is if there's going to be an impact, it happens within the first several weeks, six to eight weeks. It's really, it's very rare to have extremely long-term impacts. Ha having said that, all the vaccines are the, pay, the uh, participants are being followed for two years. This will be the third time that Rutgers was selected to run a clinical trial for a COVID-19 vaccine, but the first for Pfizer's. Families are enrolling now and kids have to qualify in order to be randomly selected. Dr. Stanley Weiss says getting this population vaccinated is critical to the state's reopening efforts. Some of the new variants that have been arising are more commonly transmitted among children than the initial variant. So we really need to offer them full protection. By getting them vaccinated, we can increase the safety of the return to school for the fall. Based on the data that you're seeing and, and the plans, is it realistic that kids are returning to school vaccinated? I think so. There is a very good chance that next week we'll hear good news from the FDA and that they'll approve the Pfizer vaccine for the 12 to 15 age group. We already have it available for those who are 16 and up, and we have enough vaccine uh, in the pipeline so that with good cooperation, we should be able to get those kids vaccinated. But that cooperation is key and many parents are nervous. For me, there's just not enough information um, as far as, you know, long-term effects. What can this do to our children? We have absolutely no idea because this is a brand new 
vaccine technology that's just being used in humans for the very first time. So for me, I, I just don't feel really, I don't feel good about it. It's already difficult convincing parents to have their six monthers receive the flu vaccine. Now we're talking about another uh, virus that's relatively new. It's going to take some education. It's going to take patience. It's going to take uh, putting the vaccine in places where parents are familiar, comfortable, and trust the exchange that you have with your, your pediatrician. As for where they'll be administered, President Biden's plan is to use pediatricians' offices and pharmacies, but that presents its own set of challenges. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. The state is also starting to send more supply to local pharmacies and smaller clinics, focusing on so-called hard-to-reach communities. In Newark, just 30 percent of all adults are fully vaccinated, compared to roughly half of all adults statewide, according to the New Jersey's Health Department. That's nearly three and a half million residents total as of this morning. Newark Mayor Raz Baraka today said he needs more access to doses from the state to raise those numbers, holding a pop-up vaccine site at a church to reach residents with disabilities, offering Moderna and Johnson & Johnson shots. They also provided health services for individuals with hearing impairment, physical and visual disabilities. The event focused on residents with special needs, but was open to everyone in the city. I feel better taking the shot. Thank you, the mayor, for helping us deaf community get the shot. It's perfect. Thank you. In another effort to boost vaccines, starting Tuesday, the FEMA-run site at NJIT in Newark will offer walk-ins every day from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. It coincides with the closure of three vaccine sites throughout Essex County, including one in Newark, due to lack of demand. And as more of the state population gets vaccinated and reclaims some normalcy, Jersey Shore business owners expect a busy summer. The unofficial kickoff to the season is just weeks away, and seaside towns are eager to make up for the extra sluggish winter and the uncertainty of last year. But businesses are reporting a new hurdle as they gear up for tourists, finding enough workers to help them reopen. Leah Mishkin has the story from Seaside Heights. It's all ready to go. The Ferris wheel glistening in the sun, the waves inviting you to come in, the shops ready for business. My intuition is with the sun coming out, the spirits of people wanting to go out and not go to out of state or out of country visitations, they're gonna come here. Only problem? We really need to get more employees. The iconic Jersey Shore destination Casino Pier starts opening daily Memorial Day weekend. Marketing director Maria Saltzman says they always get an influx of applications for summer jobs, but this year there's still about 200 employees short. We're still looking for a lot of game attendants and ride operators and cooks and bartenders, everything across the property. We normally hire um, international workers, the J1 uh, students. The problem is right now that there's an extreme backlog of uh, getting the visa appointments that the students need in order to have that visa issued. Not all consulate offices around the, the world are open yet, and so uh, they're having trouble getting these visa appointments. And what we really need is for the Biden administration to uh, prioritize these visas. Short towns up and down the state are facing the same struggle finding seasonal employees. Vicki Clark is president of Cape May County Chamber of Commerce. Our businesses are really uh, experiencing a hiring crisis. Clark says businesses are also facing challenges hiring locals. There are help wanted signs everywhere. Uh, job fairs are being held and no one is showing up to apply for the positions being offered. I think the biggest factor in my opinion is the unemployment uh, benefits that are given to people. Because of the pandemic, people can collect an additional 300 federal dollars a week on top of unemployment until September. Montana has stopped that. All the money that's going out, we're all going to have to pay that back eventually. But by people not going out to work, it is also affecting the state's income and revenue. For those that are making a minimum wage, they're saying to themselves, you know what, I might as well wait till September when this is over. Well, that doesn't help us in Seaside because in Seaside Heights, we're a four-month area at the time, so there's no jobs after September. The jobs are now. And I understand there's some people that need assistance, but, you know, when it's high school kids, college kids, 
um, you know, that's really affecting everybody at this point in time. The owner of Core's frozen custard, Gregory Core, says they normally hire 65 employees spread across six shops in New Jersey. They're still 15 short for night shifts, he says, because typically high school and college kids fill those spots. So what is the solution? I can get 14 and 15 year olds and I started hiring some 15 year old with having to get the parents uh, letter of permission to work till nine o'clock and I'm thinking at least I can have a store open till nine. That leaves him with three to four hours of lost revenue since most shops stay open until midnight or 1 a.m. Then we have the senior citizens that we hire, those that are retirees, and they're frightened of the virus and being in crowds. We need the older 18 plus year olds that could work past nine o'clock, could work over 40 hours. So those are the ones that we are looking for and there's a lot of those are probably on unemployment. I'm Leah Mishkin for NJ Spotlight News. We'll head further down the shore to Atlantic City, and the state is looking for a whole lot more than just seasonal workers to rebuild the resort town post-pandemic. How about some financial help from the new legal weed industry? A Murphy-appointed team known as the Atlantic City Restart and Recovery Working Group this week released a report with just that suggestion. The report is designed to act as a roadmap in helping the city bounce back from this health crisis and suggested using money from recreational marijuana sales to help pay for the work needed, including rebuilding the iconic boardwalk, upgrades to the downtown business district, and making the city's economy less reliant on the casino industry. We've heard that for years. It also dug into the personal side of this recovery by suggesting more services for drug abuse and addressing poor nutrition and outreach to youth. Aside from using legal weed sales, the report failed to explain how all these projects would be funded. As you heard Leah Mishkin report, employers are struggling to find workers, yet the claims for unemployment benefits are rising. Rhonda Schaffler sorts through it all in tonight's top business stories. Rhonda. Brianna, it's hard to figure out exactly what's going on in the job market. We know thousands of people are out of work here in New Jersey and more are losing their jobs every week. In fact, the state labor department says new claims for unemployment benefits rose in the latest week, even as nationally new claims are falling. Yet as we've been reporting, companies say they can't find workers. The convenience store chain Wawa said it's going to have to temporarily close some stores because it can't find employees. Economists thought the U.S. economy created one million jobs last month, and that was absolutely flat out wrong. The government's job report out today wasn't even close. Only 266,000 new jobs were created in April. I asked Gus Fauché, the chief economist at PNC Financial Services Group, to make sense of all this. So it's unclear exactly what's going on with the labor market. So it could be that there are still some people who are concerned about catching the coronavirus, and so they've dropped out of the labor force. Uh, I think you're still dealing with issues with parents, particularly mothers of young children whose kids are being schooled at home. Fauché also says with those extra unemployment benefits, there's a group of people who don't see the need to get a job right away. He is sticking by his forecast that job growth will pick up over the next few months. As we reported yesterday, Governor Murphy got some flack this week for his veto of a red tape commission designed to review business regulations, but some are cheering that move. The governor's veto came after nearly three dozen labor community and environmental groups had said the bill would have weakened regulations. For over a year now, the Small Business Administration has been providing billions of dollars in PPP loans to businesses impacted by the pandemic. But this week, the SBA announced its run out of money for most borrowers before the scheduled end date of the program, which is May 31st. The SBA will continue to fund applications that have already been approved. Now, here's a check on the Wall Street Trading Day. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. This weekend, join Rhonda Schaffler for NJ Business Beat. It's all about the Garden State. She checks in with the next generation of Jersey farmers about the new technology and opportunities changing the state's agricultural industry. You can find it on NJPBS Saturdays at 5 p.m. and Sundays at 9.30 a.m.
Well, not only is New Jersey one of the most expensive states in the nation to buy and own a home, pandemic pricing has made it even tougher to get into the market. Lawmakers want to provide extra help for low- and moderate-income first-time buyers by creating a new tax incentive program to help them save for that big purchase and set aside aid to encourage more buyers to purchase a fixer-upper. NJ Spotlight News senior writer Colleen O'Day is here to explain how it'll work. Colleen, affordable housing, not a new issue here, but these are some interesting new ideas at least. Yeah, you know, most of what New Jersey has really focused on to date has been um, creating new rental units. There hasn't been a, a huge emphasis on getting people into homes. And, you know, home ownership is really the way that many middle income families have kind of grown their wealth over time. And, and certainly it's true today. So there are two programs that the state is uh, or that legislators are thinking of to try to um, help this along. One would be to encourage people to save money for a home uh, up to $15,000 a year in banks that you know agreed to, to create these programs. And that money, you, you, you get a tax break. Uh, every year on your, your income taxes. And the interest would also be tax-free, provided that you use that money to buy a house or you know pay for your closing costs or whatever. So you know that's kind of a novel um, program uh, that we haven't heard of before. And there's a second one, which would provide direct grants, uh, $10,000 would be the, the maximum uh, for folks who are looking, they would have to be first-time home buyers. These folks would be more, um, specifically targeted at low and moderate income folks. So you couldn't have more than 80% of the median income in whatever county that you're looking to buy in. And you could, you'd be eligible for directly $10,000 either to buy a home or um, rehabilitate a first home. And what does the support look like for this, Colleen? And is part of the plan also, I mean, if it gets that far, just to get the word out because home buying in general um, is daunting, especially for first timers. Yeah, you know, and I, I spoke to some housing advocates who say that there are some programs out there to help with low and moderate income, and people just don't know about them. You know, they, there are some that already exist. Um, certainly, this this one would be a, a welcome addition to those. Um, it, it the bills passed unanimously and with bipartisan support, so that's always a good sign. The savings bill doesn't have a great cost attached to it. The grants to low-income folks would cost about $25 million a year. There's always a question whether that's the kind of thing the governor would support, but certainly he has been a he has talked about supporting um, you know, housing opportunities for the low and moderate income in the past. And also making it sustainable so the program can continue. Colleen O'Day, good to check in with you today. Thanks. Thank you, Bree. Intra-party turmoil is how many analysts and even some members of the Republican Party would describe the state of the national GOP. From divisions over the former president to current leadership and policy, there's no shortage of hurdles in unifying the party. Our chief political correspondent Michael Aaron goes on the record with Ben Dworkin, director of the Rowan University Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship, about whether the national battle could have implications in New Jersey and another former Republican firebrand back in the spotlight. Ben Dworkin of Rowan, how divided is the National Republican Party and what is it divided about? The civil war going on in the National Republican Party right now is a serious one. And it's different than, say, past battles because it's not ideological. This is not about Goldwater conservatives against Nelson Rockefeller moderates uh, in the party. This is fundamentally about Donald Trump um, and how loyal you have been and how uh, loyal you promised to be to Donald Trump. So that makes it different than other battles. It's a significant one. I, I heard someone on the radio say this week, this is not a battle for the soul of the Republican Party. Trump owns it lock, stock, and barrel. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? I agree with the second part of that. That is, Trump is clearly in control of a majority of the party. People who are absolutely devoted to him or really devoted, if not absolutely, uh, are still the bulk of the party, a, a clear majority. That doesn't mean this fight is over. 
what is the implication for the governor's race here in New Jersey uh, for Jack Cedarelli, the likely Republican gubernatorial nominee? Uh, this is now a difficult terrain for him to navigate, uh, made more so but underscored by this schism we're talking about. Yes or no? No, yes, absolutely. Look, it, it, it's always been uh, a difficult terrain for somebody like Jack Cedarelli, the leading candidate and odds on favorite to win the Republican nomination for governor to run against Phil Murphy. No major politician on the Republican side has stepped up to fill that void, to step up and do it. So that's one. The second, just quickly, the second reason why I think we're not going to see the national fight spill over into and have implications for the Republican Party here in New Jersey um, is because of geography and education. Fact is, Trump voters, the not Trump voters, but the Trump uh, base is largely white working class living in rural areas. And we are a very educated state in New Jersey, and we don't have many, if any, uh, rural areas uh, the way other states do. And so I think it's just an inhospitable place uh, for Trumpism to really take hold. Meanwhile, eight people who would like to be the Republican presidential nominee in 2024 are gathering in Texas this weekend for a kind of cattle call audition. Right. Chris Christie included. What are his prospects going forward for president? I think he has a, a solid shot. He's an extremely talented uh, politician. Uh, with tremendous political skills. I think the question that we're going to look for out of this cattle call, which will be the first of many for those who are thinking about running for president, will Chris Christie or any of these others really be able to find a message that resonates with all parts of the Republican Party? Ben Dworkin of Rowan University, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Finally, a nod to mom as we head into this Mother's Day weekend. There's no doubt this pandemic has taken a mental and emotional toll on everyone, but research shows mothers have shouldered much of the burden. In Newark today, an event to put their health and well-being first and celebrate all they do. Melissa Rose Cooper reports. Ellen Wright can't help but show her excitement. I have four kids and nine grandbabies. My youngest grandbaby was 12 years old yesterday. Sheila Wright, happy birthday! For months, the proud mother and grandmother says she couldn't see her family because of COVID, but now she's grateful. Blessed. Blessed, I'm very blessed. Her strength and resilience is being celebrated by the city of Newark. Officials dedicating this health and wellness event to moms just in time for Mother's Day. Last Mother's Day, we were all in the house and everybody was scared. So we are trying to let people understand that we are in a new day and that we're not out of danger yet, but we're moving in that direction. Those of you upstairs, come on downstairs. We need you to come outside. The city partnering with Walgreens Pharmacy to offer residents at Crutchmer Senior Center free health screenings and COVID tests. In a pandemic like this, it's more important than ever that people are learning ways to take care of themselves and their family members um, with health and wellness. It's a Mother's Day Father's Day feast. Get up, get fast, come downstairs, come downstairs, come downstairs, come downstairs. Members from the Department of Health on hand providing information to people about where to get vaccinated. That's the most important thing, trying to keep people safe and healthy. And uh, we want to create an atmosphere we're talking about keeping our family safe, keeping our community safe. And uh, we have a lot of work to do in terms of communities like this to make sure people are vaccinated. And with plenty of food, giveaways, and endless music to keep everyone's feet moving, the moms here say this celebration means the world. Oh, make me feel good. <laughs> make me feel good. I love it. I'm loving it to the fullest. And even though Mother's Day comes around just once a year, city officials say it's something that needs to be celebrated every day, now more than ever. It helps to lift up the vision of matriarchs uh, here, not only uh, in the city of Newark, 
and the great work that women have done uh, in our city, especially mothers, and to highlight their efforts, uh, especially at times like this, uh, going through and coming out of COVID, uh, realizing that these mothers really held the glue and staple uh, together to continue to push uh, our families and continue to uh, allow us to walk through some troubling times. On Mother's Day, these moms say they won't ever forget. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. It was another big news week. If you missed any of the top stories, you can catch Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz Saturday at 6 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. on NJPBS, along with Chatbox. That airs Saturday at 6.30 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. That does it for us this week. I'm Brianna Venosi. For the entire news team, thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. NJM Insurance Group serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. I'm Kayla, and this is what I work for, to teach him, to protect her, and to take care of me, too. I need health insurance that does the same, that makes things easier for my schedule so I can focus on what matters. This is my life, and this is how Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey works for me, and him, and her.